I'm here with Paul Sarker, high-powered entertainment attorney and formal <laughs> Marvel uh, general counsel for, I believe it was six years? Uh, yeah, five years, nine months. Who's counting? I guess my first question for you is because you got there, it was um, t- 2009? Yeah, so um, I started actually as an intern in law school. I applied for an internship basically couple months after Iron Man 1 came out uh, as I was a third year law student because I wanted to do entertainment. My uh, Everything I had done in law school to that point was like corporate law related work, like at uh-huh. huge law firms working for, you know, billion dollar, multi-billion dollar, you know, fortune Not bad. 50 companies. Uh, but I wasn't as excited about it as I was entertainment. So I saw an internship opportunity at Marvel and I applied and they uh, they actually said nothing for like the first week. I didn't hear anything. And then I sent a follow up and then they called me within like five minutes. And they were like, are you serious? Were you serious? We weren't sure. And I said I was. And then I, we did a phone interview and I got the internship. And that was all pre-Disney merger. My right. internship uh, started like 2009 and then it went well. So they asked me to join full time after I graduated. So I, you know, I turned down the law firm route and then I decided, uh, you know, I started basically a month after the bar exam. And that was my first day was August 31st, 2009, which is when, All right, market. which is when Disney announced that they were buying uh, Marvel. No way. It was, it was the it was, same day. It was the same day. Yeah. Was it was crazy. crazy. Cause I remember I was coming into work and I didn't, I knew a handful of people because I interned, but like it's different when you intern versus coming in full time. And um, this is a funny story that I don't really share that much. So um, happy to have it. I walk in at like nine o'clock, nine o five, whatever it is, and I have a lot of friends that work in finance and they're like investment sure. bankers, and they're all texting me like, "Oh, Mar- you know, Disney's buying your company. Is everyone <laughs> going to get laid off? Like, whatever." And that never happened because you know Marvel's really a small company with a big reach and like it, it punches yeah. well, well above its weight. Yes, it does. But it was so confidential that literally no one knew what was happening except for maybe like the top three or four executives. And there was a group of like 15 people traveling to the office from South Korea to present Marvel, uh, an idea for a theme park license yep. in Korea. And I had no idea because this was literally my first day. And my boss was like, hey, Paul, can you take these people to a conference room for like an hour Mm -hmm. and just like keep them busy because we have to make this announcement. (laughs) And so at the time, that was when they made the announcement to all the employees that Disney was going to buy the company in a couple months. And like, obviously, if you'd been at Marvel for 20 years, you have questions about like benefits and healthcare, and like, am I going to lose? So like, that was a very important conversation that they had to have. And the folks from Korea, because I don't speak Korean, sure. and they spoke some English, but it wasn't great. Was, there was a huge language barrier. But we were making small talk, and they were like, how long have you been working here? And I said, <laughs> this is my first day. And they were like, oh, what the hell is going on? This is nuts. Uh, but they were very nice. I mean, it turns out that, you know, Disney is so, you know, their theme park business is so mature that it's really hard right. to have a competing one. So, I don't, I don't think that Korean deal went anywhere, but it was um, a funny story for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, Disney in general is pretty mature in most ways, I would guess. Um, right. And they've been. So, what was it like? Because so you were there. I mean, you got in right at the point where the Marvel Cinematic Universe was taking off in a huge way. Year after Iron Man, you were there for I think like the Avengers movie and whatever. Yeah. I mean. I was there you, through, go ahead. through pre-production of Cap uh, Civil War. Cool. Which is top top five, I'd say. Yeah, it's it's good. I mean, Winter Soldier, I think, is better. But yes, I was I there for, yeah. for a lot of it. Um, I wouldn't say ground floor, but I would say, like, before it became the dominant, like, movie studio. I think we were ascending. Right. Yes. Uh, but the team that's in place like the Kevin Feige's the mm-hmm. business affairs they've been there they're probably there getting all the pieces together for maybe four or five years before I got there right 
what was it like though to kind of be in the center of that maybe not I mean, it, it wasn't like the preeminent movie studio in the world like it is now when you were there, but it was well on its way. Perhaps by the time you left was kind of nearing the peak. What was it like kind of being in the center of that? And did you expect it to go to get that big when you started? Definitely, I did not expect that. You know, I, uh, I'd i like to say that I saw that coming, but I, I did not. <laughs> I, I basically, I knew that, Marvel had a lot of valuable property and I thought right. that Iron Man was a great movie and that I figured like anything in entertainment would be um, cool to do, right? Because sure. like entertainment jobs right out of law school are hard to get. Right. And especially in New York. And so when I was there, uh, that's why I took the internship. And then when I was there, I realized I was just, there were so many things going on that the public didn't know about, like that I had, no insight into as a intern or very little but early on maybe the first or second week of my internship my boss was like hey like things are going to be taken off uh right. um, and you know we're ramping up the studio do you have any interest or like are you open to going to california for like you know time to time or for a couple months or relocating in a you know, long term like because he was like we're we're running the studio but we're 3000 miles away. Right. Do you want to be more involved in that? Is that interest you? Or do you want to do the corporate stuff, the licensing? The, like, what do you want to do? Because we're doing so many, there's plenty of work. And that was a very cool conversation. And I would, I hadn't at that point been to California, but I was like, yeah, absolutely. I'd love to try it out. Yeah. And they sent me there for two months um, early on in my career. And I, it was my first time in California and I loved it. And I decided right, Beautiful. right then and there, I was like, I'm going to take the bar exam and and see what happens and so when we started like i said we were a small studio and smaller studios basically like we weren't in we were kind of an indie studio but we weren't like a small budget we didn't make small budget films we made big budget no. films but we were a small <laughs> studio made iron man yeah and uh, so but the, the the thing is there's a lot of um it gets easier at least it's more efficient if you're a huge studio that's making 30 movies a year because there's sure. it's easier from like the guild perspective and distribute and distribution's a lot easier and it's like you're a well-oiled machine we didn't have any of that in the beginning paramount was our distributor but as you know disney sort of bought the company they sort of bought out paramount and its distribution rights because right. it was very important for disney to distribute the avengers because that was like paramount was contractually supposed to distribute avengers we had to do some amendment, get out of that deal so that Disney could basically launch the event. would have had, yeah. Yeah. I mean, can I ask also just, um, I, I swear I'll ask actual questions about your job in a second. Just, yeah. um, so how old are you at this point? Because not only do you have what I'm going to go ahead and call one of the more probably enviable legal jobs, like high profile, definitely, I'm, I'm sure lots of folk desired your position. It sounds like, it's, it's just, it just sounds so cool to be, I'm a suspect of Marvel, but you're also like a like fresh out of law school guy when you're doing this. Well, so yeah, when I started, I was probably let's see, what twenty five, right? Uh, and then when I moved to LA, I was maybe twenty seven or eight, and when I left, I was thirty one. <laughs> that is a lot of experience in a short amount of time. That yeah, thank you. I mean, it, everything it felt so. Here's like. Marvel's like that. Like they'll throw people in and see what you can handle. And if you do well, you'll get more. And that's, cool. if you think about it, like Kevin Feige started as an intern yeah. and they gave him, uh, what was it? When one of the Spider-Mans and then I, Hulk really was his, I guess his first movie that he oversaw and he crushed mm -hmm. it, knocked it out of the, I really liked the first Hulk and then he got Iron Man. So if you demonstrate angry one, no, uh, the Louis Leterrier, oh, gotcha, Ed Norton, gotcha, gotcha. and um, Ed Norton, cool. Liv Tyler, yeah. So I, like, if you succeed, they'll give you more. If you demonstrate a sort of willingness uh, to learn and take on responsibility, they'll give you more and more. They won't necessarily pay you for it, but they'll <laughs> let you do Perfect. it as long as you do it well. And so that was kind of the first five years of my career. Um, and we were getting into new things all the time, like live events, not necessarily right. theme parks because that's kind of off limits, but family entertainment centers and traveling shows and 40 rides. Like there were areas where Disney would allow us to sort of 
have autonomy, well, not autonomy, but have a business subject to their kind of approval and consent. Uh, and things like video games took off. Now, I didn't do the video. I wasn't the video game lawyer, right, right, right. but I would do if it were like related to films, like promotional games or licensing, like uh, Pachinko was a big thing uh, cool. for us. So I would do that. But I wasn't the game. The games group had a separate lawyer. Um, but like digital wasn't even a thing. When I started streaming, people didn't stream content. Yeah. Right. It was like network TV, cable TV were sort of maybe down the line future business models and it was all about the movies and then right. animation but animation was you know not necessarily a profit center it was really just more a way to sort of like get you know to develop creative material mm -hmm. and to you know help with merchandise but it wasn't really like a profit center so it was all about the movies and now you know 10 years later disney plus and the streaming side of things is huge digital people reading comments digitally um marvel.com like all of those businesses just took off yeah everything's changed in uh, a decade and change i was going to ask like were there any whispers by the time you left about a disney wanting their own netflix because i think netflix started to stream stuff early 2010s and obviously now that's what everybody's doing and disney plus is a giant part of their their strategy were there any whispers by the time you left about that or I think it was still later? I think so. Maybe at the, at a certain pay grade, like it, not in my level, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. there were no, there was nothing that I knew of. I think people at my level would have known maybe a year later, because if you remember back in like 2014, 15, Netflix had this huge slate of Marvel streaming shows. Oh yeah, of course. And at the time, when we as a company decided to license four shows plus the defenders to Netflix, mm -hmm. they had a bunch of options. So they could have kept making shows for like 10 years if they really wanted to. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was like at the time, Marvel wasn't, I don't think they would have done that deal if they were thinking about having a streaming service or if right. Disney was thinking yeah, about having a sense. streaming service. I think at the time it was like, well, who, I mean, and Disney owned a portion of Hulu at the time. So Hulu was mm -hmm. there and Hulu was like, you know, the experiment in streaming that Disney and Fox and NBC sort of all shared together. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't a at that point, it was still an unknown. And when you're running a company the size of Disney, you're not going to necessarily bet on things that are unknown. So you may you may like put a feeler out there but you're not going to contribute or license like your best content to something that's unknown. Once Netflix proved the model, then all the wheels started turning and then Disney plus, then there was a ton of momentum to do Disney plus and ESPN plus and all that. Right. But that happened. It, it, there may have been whispers at the highest levels, but it wasn't something that I was privy to. Sure. It was so interesting to watch that as like as covering it, just the, 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 the Marvel Netflix shows, which, yeah, you're right. I mean, obviously they wouldn't put that on if they want to have their own service and then kind of them being going away one by one and saying like, ooh, they're planning something. They're planning something big. And of course now we- Well, have. the person that replaced me after I left uh, and we were supposed to, we, I, replace isn't the right word. Like she joined as I was leaving, gotcha. but we could have worked together if I chose to stay. Mm -hmm. uh, she ended up moving to Disney Plus. And, and got a big job over there. So like, yeah. it was a great opportunity. I think if I had stayed a year or two more, maybe that would have been how things went down. But you know, you right. never, you can't really look in hindsight and be like, oh, blah, blah, blah. So yeah, I mean, th 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 this might be one of those questions you can't answer, but like, um, why did you decide to leave when you did just, uh, yeah. so um, I don't think it's any secret that like Marvel is very uh, frugal. Right. And so I don't I really had, know that actually, but good well, I mean, they're very successful. Yes, they but are. I know that they're, they're good at business and they know the value of their brand. So they mm -hmm. know that like for every person that's working there, there's probably a thousand that want to work there. Yeah. Good point. And so, you know, they're like, Hey, you know, we could fill our roster with people graduating from Harvard law or Yale or whatever. <laughs> You know, we we post one flyer at a law school. We'll have um, you know a hundred people that are, want to attend an event. So right. there's no shortage. So they've kind of have this view that like you know if you want to work there, you'll have job security. 
you'll learn cool things, you'll learn interesting, th- you'll work on interesting things and you'll learn a lot and you'll be sort of at the pinnacle. So it's a dream job and that's how they sure. view it. And because of that, they don't feel like they need to, in my case, or at the junior level, like they didn't feel like they needed to uh, promote or, or compensate people compensate, like at, yeah. at, you know, at the level that I felt like I needed to be, no, that I course. felt like I was worth. And so that was why I left. That makes complete sense. Yeah. Um, while you were there, I'm sure you get this question all the time, but I got I got to try to ask about the contracts you're negotiating with the actors. Now, I saw another interview with you where like folks try to ask you like, you know, who had a crazy writer? And I, I know you can't really say that, but um, or perhaps you can. Um, well, like- so the writer thing is really more uh, from my, my experience. It's more like a musician concept, like really? a touring musician. They have these writers where, because I I do that now in my current job where, Mm. you know, we'll we'll host, we we have clients that have venues and no host concerts. That's like someone's in town for a day or two days and they want their room to be stocked with X, Y, Z, like, you know, like only blue M&Ms or whatever, right? So what have (laughs) you. That's the classic. But uh, actors don't typically have writers. That's not to say that no actors have writers, but it's, it's more... It's more like it's a longer term engagement. Sure. So if you're negotiating a multi-picture deal, you're not as focused on what color the M&Ms are. You're focused on sort of the, the compensation, how long the deal is, what whether you have to turn down other projects like the scope of exclusivity. Can you do TV? Can you do other films in the, in the downtime? Mm. Uh, what is your bonus thresholds and what are your bonus amounts? If you're going to get bonuses at all, like things like that, where your credit is. So the, the things that go on the rider are less, I mean, they're more like nice to haves, but it ultimately when these, when you're have the opportunity to be in a Marvel film or in the Marvel, you know, television canon, uh, it's for a lot of people, the opportunity of a lifetime and they're not going to like course, yeah. screw it up because of something minuscule, like, like the kind of, um, you know, fruit on there, whatever. <laughs> but if you are someone at the top of the game, and right. you know you are guaranteed box office, then you can demand certain things. And that's when you sort of like you get to take care of your team as well in, in, a, in a lot of ways. Mm-hmm. Great. I mean, I, I was going to ask, like, to what degree the contracts were individualized, but I think you pretty much covered that. Um, yeah. Uh, in terms of licensing stuff, um, I wasn't really sure, like, what does that entail? So like, what are you licensing? We're talking like restaurants, happy meals, not video games. You mentioned Funko pops. So something you did. think about it as everything under the sun mm-hmm. that is not controversial. So <laughs> gotcha. things like, you know, feminine hygiene or alcohol or tobacco firearms. We're not going to do that. Mm-hmm. But anything like anything that Disney would associate its brand with, we will license. And that's another part of my job that is less talked about. But I did, I was probably, I did 30 or 40 percent of the merchandise licensing agreements for Marvel domestically in the US cool. and some internationally for probably three or four years. And that was, there were some weeks where we would do 20 license agreements, some weeks where we would do 10. Like it was, I mean, it could have easily been 2,000 or 3,000 agreements while I was there. Wow. And I didn't do the business affairs. I, I didn't necessarily negotiate the deals. So we have salespeople and licensing people who have certain categories. So someone's job is to do um, like toys or sure. hard lines, which is, which is considered toys. Soft lines is like apparel mer- and, and backpacks and things like oh, I didn't that. Know that. Hard and, soft. And, and they'll... And so like as many companies in the world that make t-shirts, I'm sure we try to do a license with them. Sometimes you, you do deals for things like, you know, direct to retail. So you do a deal right. with Target for like them to create their own product. Or That's just an example. I'm not saying we specifically of did that, but um, so literally anything, anything under the sun. And one of my ideas, which I, which never got off the ground, but I think you can print this because I thought we should do a home fitness line. Cause I was like, people wouldn't look like superheroes. Absolutely. So think about that. Like, you know, like an ab roller, like a Spider-Man ab roller or something like that seemed like a natural thing to me. And it just, there wasn't really, 
no one listens to lawyers for ideas like that. <laughs> but, um, you know, I'm a, and that's part of why I want to do, and I do better call Paul and I enjoy it so much because like, um, you know, when you're at a company, whether it's Marvel or Disney or whatever, and you're a lawyer, you're viewed as a legal resource, right? So people come to sure. you with legal questions they, or they need something papered or they want to know the risk or, and, and so you're they lawyer, don't, yeah. they're not like, Hey, who would be a good director for this next franchise? Or, you know, what, you know, we're thinking about going in this direction, or do you think an EDM festival at Disneyland would work? Even though those were all ideas that I had, no one cared because I was a lawyer. <laughs> And so better call Paul, I'm a creative, right? Like yes. I run the show. We decide, I just, we decide my, my co-host and I decide what, what topics we're going to talk about, what the direction of the show is going to be like, what we're going to say. And so I get to be creative and that's a part of my personality that as a lawyer, I don't really get to exercise. Right. Um, about better call Paul. So it's been on for a while now. I guess I have two quick questions. Um, one, just what's your overall goal with it? I mean, you just said you wanted to be more creative with it. What are your kind of hopes for it? And also, um, what is uh, Mesh, um, Mesh Lakani. Lakani's gig? Because it says like he's an entertainment enthusiast. It's like right. former Marvel associate attorney and entertainment enthusiast Mesh Lakani. Like he's got to be doing something else, right? Or is he just yeah, so he's TV? like uh No, so he's like a Web3 investor Ooh. slash like kind of like he's like almost like a vc unto himself like he invests in companies and um he used to run funds for like right. you know privately wealthy people in tech and i think he does that but he's pivoting into media and web3 and so if you see i have a gutter cat shirt on not because mm -hmm. of him but like uh, I went to a gutter cat gang party last night. It's New York City NYC N <laughs> NFT, and I got the shirt. And like, they're they're one of my clients now, and they're awesome. This is such a cool company and like exciting brand to work for. So, I wanted to rock it. But he's he's basically Web three crypto. All right, cool. That's pretty exciting. And yeah, and as for the podcast, I listened to the episode on um, the Top Gun lawsuit. It's like, how do you choose what to talk about? And is this kind of new and exciting for you? Because you were kind of new to the creating field uh so yeah i mean looking back i've i've had over the past 10 15 years so i took improv classes sure, i fun. i used to dj i used to produce music so i always had these like side passions and i never really got off the ground because i'm so busy as a lawyer so like yeah. you do things for a couple months and then it fizzles um and i was never like i want to be playing festivals or what i mean maybe that would have been the goal but i didn't have the time to sort of get there right, and right. do it that well um, but the podcast is, I guess there's two things now. One is I enjoy it. So I want to keep doing it. And two, I think it's a platform, right? Because there's a lot of things that, um, are happening in our industry that people don't really know about. And I'm, I'm, I'm a lawyer. Like we, we, we sell our service as a law firm and I don't want to necessarily, um, you know, give away the farm with the show, but I do think there's a lot of information that could be, that could benefit people, um, and so that's part of it. Like it's, it helps me learn. Cause when we pick these different topics, there's things I know about some of them, but others I don't, right? Like I didn't really know defamation that well, but when we decided mm -hmm. to do the Johnny Depp Amber Heard trial, I had to learn defamation. And I have clients that I have, I have friends that are lawyers that do defamation cases all the time. And they know mm -hmm. it to a level that I, you know, that's way beyond what I know, but it's still like, they'll listen to the episode and be like, Hey, that was a pretty good summary of, of what cool. we do. And so it's part of it's like to educate myself and to stay on top of things. For example, like during COVID, um, when NFTs exploded, right? Mm -hmm. Like it was something that existed for probably five or six years, yeah. but it didn't, you know, get into the public sort of zeitgeist until 2020. And now I would say NFTs and, and blockchain are probably 30% of my practice. And really? Yeah, because there's so it's there's so much copyright in it, and so part of doing the show is like, I get to stay on top of things that interest me. Yeah. And then you dig deeper and then you broaden your, your network because candidly, if you're a lawyer at a law firm, like your value is tied to sort of your skill set and also the, your reach and the amount of clients you have. And so if this is a way for me to sort of like build my brand, and, yeah, and demonstrate knowledge, then I'm going to keep doing it, right. So people write articles, 
they speak at panels or in CLEs. And I had done stuff like that. I used to write articles about, you know, NCAA, name, image, likeness regulations, and even stuff about climate change. And I also would speak at panels and, and you know, be willing to present on CLEs. But this allows me more control. Now I have to run everything by my law firm. They right. have to approve every episode. But they've been very cool about the whole thing and, and, and supportive. Obviously, there's things we can't talk about, and I have to use my judgment. But Naturally, yeah. Um, they've been very supportive and I think it's cool. And I'm, you know, I'm not the only lawyer with the podcast, but I want to no. be the lawyer with the best podcast. Exciting. I mean, yeah, there are some good ones out there, man. Some good lawyer YouTube shows. You could, um, trade up sometime maybe. Well, we are. Show. So we've been recording video for the past, um, six episodes, but we haven't released the YouTube yet, but we have it archived. It. That's cool. Yeah. Um, okay. This question I just came up with, and you know, and I, again, this is one of those ones where I'm like, if you can't answer it, you can't answer it. Just you mentioned all the crypto part of your business. I'm just interested um, with the recent kind of a tumble. Can you give like a general impression of your take? Like are folk in that space a little alarmed or is the uh, optimism still riding high? Uh, I would say the people who are truly in the space and believe it to be sort of like a transformational mm -hmm. technology are not alarmed. You know, I think they view it as an opportunity, but there's no question like when something falls 50 or 60 percent, like it, it's concerning yeah. or 70 or whatever. Um, and I think there's always going to be naysayers. But the thing about crypto is that the news cycle is so schizophrenic. It's like yes, it all positive. It's all negative. It's everything in between. Uh, you're going to have people who are like Warren Buffett or Charlie Munger, who's like, I don't know, 100 years old, who says, oh, it's it's a scam. It, it has no intrinsic value. And then you have other people who are saying, well, no, the dollar could be considered something that has no intrinsic value. I mean, the U.S. government stands behind it. The U.S. government has an army. So therefore, and the world has decided it's the reserve currency, but it doesn't necessarily have to have an intrinsic value. And there's all these transaction costs for using fiat currencies. So I don't think fundamentally the justification for why Bitcoin has a, a, a purpose has changed. Mm -hmm. But I think one of the things, one of the main talking points that the sort of Bitcoin proselytes or apostles have been saying is it's a hedge against inflation. So it's like gold, right? Because um, as in theory, inflation is when the money in circulation keeps growing and growing and the goods and services don't grow as fast. So everything costs more. Right. And if you have something that is finite, like in theory, the amount of gold on the planet it is finite, although we keep mining more, uh, right. but it doesn't grow as fast as inflation or because you can't just print it like out of thin air, like you can print right. money. So Bitcoin is supposed to have a, a fixed amount, 21 million. And that, because of that, it's not supposed to be subject to inflation. And that's one of the theories. And in the past six months, it's been very subject to inflation. I mean, mm -hmm. as interest rates have risen, tech stocks have come down and cryptos come down. So it's really been performing more like a tech stock than a hedge against inflation. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I haven't heard a good answer for that, but I think if anyone had an answer, they'd probably be very rich. I think the people who were early adopters and who believe in it for, a techno for its like transformative technological purposes still do. And right. I think if you got into Bitcoin at 50 or 60 grand, you probably weren't an early adopter. Um, and, but I think my clients and the people who are heavily invested, and this is not investment advice, I think they think it's going to keep rising eventually. Great, it's definitely cool. Yeah. Um, I know we're out of time, but put your time for one more question. Yeah, yeah, let's do it. Because I did want to ask this just, and I know this is after your time, but when I think of like Marvel and lawyer and legal stuff, like the biggest Marvel legal story out there is probably the very strange custody agreement that Sony and Disney have over Spider-Man. I know again, after your time, but do you have just any impressions of that? Is that going to shift one way or the other, do you think in time or is? Well, so I would say it's, it probably dates back to, I want to say like 98 or 99, right? So sure. Tobey Maguire. Um, right, exactly. So Spider-Man was licensed to Sony. The film rights were licensed to Sony 25 years ago. And the relationship is complicated because the license was perpetual. Mm -hmm. So no one, it, I, 
I don't want to say it's a bad deal. At the time, it was, you know, it is what it is. Hindsight's 2020. No one's agreeing to perpetual exclusive film licenses now uh, if they have the leverage to not. I mean, sometimes you don't have the choice, but yeah. like if they didn't license it perpetually, uh, then eventually it would be a clock where Spider Man would come back and people would mark their calendars, but they didn't. And so the price is just going to go up and up and up because Spider Man is such a valuable property. So they have to work together, right? So it, it's so important to Sony Studio that they're not going to give it up, right? And Spider Man figures into a lot of Marvel movies, mm-hmm. so or and and shows and whatever. So it's a character that Kevin needs in his toolbox too. So it's just there's too much at stake for both sides for them to not be cooperative. But at the right. same time, when you have huge companies fighting over big dollars or not fighting over, but like negotiating over big dollars and trying to spill it a huge pie, everything becomes very sensitive. It's just, it's just so interesting to me how that might play out. And thanks for your, thanks for your take. All right. Paul, this has been a lot of fun. Everybody okay, listen cool. to Better Call Paul wherever podcasts are available. Thanks for talking yes, to us. Definitely check it out. Thank you so much. This yeah. was fun.